I was flipping through the newspaper. There was a classified ad that said local investor liquidating portfolio, 129 units, all must go. So I called him and he ended up selling me 56 of his units, held the paper. I came up with 10% down. Now, they were multiple locations, but he really treated it like a big multifamily project. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 172. My guest today is Jason Pero, and Jason bought his first duplex in 2001, and he left his day job in 2012. He now has over 640 units that he owns and manages through his management company, Pero Real Estate, which is located in Erie, Pennsylvania. Jason is also the president of his local RIA, and in 2018, he began syndicating apartment opportunities. He currently has 147 units under contract. Jason? Thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. So you definitely have a lot going on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Born and raised in a small town outside of Erie uh, called Northeast Pennsylvania. Grew up on a farm, graduated high school, went to college. Really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but started learning about about money and and how finances work, and um, you know really took an interest in real estate because uh, it seemed all the all the rich people or all the wealthy people that I knew about or read about had some form of uh, some form of real estate in their uh, in their portfolio, and um, so I took a job in sales. I uh, worked in a couple years in pharmaceutical sales. Uh, grew into a medical device, surgical device uh, sales position. Um, held that until about 2012. Uh, during that time, uh, you know, my wife and I uh, basically invested one person's salary into buying rental property. We did it the old-fashioned way. So we um, would save up our money for a down payment. You know, first $3,000 we ever saved uh, went for the down payment on our very first first duplex, which uh, we closed on a week before 9-11. Um, you know, it cost uh, about $33,000. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of a value add play there. But once I took that down and the rent started coming in and saw how easy it could be, uh, I was hooked. And and then we just, you know, we'd buy a duplex or a triplex every year and sort of started buying more. And, and as we got better jobs, we, we bought more and more property and built up the portfolio to about 290 units when I left my day job ultimately in 2012. It's interesting that your wife was with you on this right from the start. I mean, what, what kind of conversations did you have in the beginning when you were looking to buy your first duplex? And, and you know, did you have to convince her or did she have to convince you? Um, no, I definitely had to convince her. And we, we joke about it all the time these days is that, um, you know, I told her, I said, look, if we save our money and we, we live like we're still college kids, we could, you know, we could build this empire and work for ourselves and not really have to worry about day jobs the rest of our lives. So we became really obsessed about um, saving money and, um, you know, and investing in real estate. And, um, you know, it took her a while to, to really kind of buy into it. I mean, I think every year she just so, sort of looked at me like I was crazy and said, well, what are we buying? What are we doing here? But as, as time went on and, and you know, we had, uh, had a couple kids along the way and we were able to leave our day jobs and, uh, looking at our friends and, and, you know, a lot of them still have to work, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, we're able to travel, we're able to do the things we want to do. You know, I'm at, at our kids' school for every, every play, every practice, every game, all those, all those types of things. So um, I, I think over time, she, she really saw it, really was able to see the true value and look back and, and uh, be thankful for that decision we made. But, but it all came back to that idea of, of working for ourselves and, and, not having to be, you know, tied to a corporate job until we're sixty or seventy years old. And that first duplex that you bought, do you still own it? I do. I still do. I call it my good luck charm. Sounds like it was a thirty thousand dollar acquisition. Sure. What, yep. what, what are you making off of it each month? So when we bought it, uh, 
the rents were, and, and I have to forgive myself if I'm wrong at the exact numbers, but the rents were like $350 a month for two bedroom apartments. And that was way below market. So we, we jumped those up to four, $475 a month per unit. Now, uh, we're making about, uh, 550 and 575 on the other one. Um, no mortgage on the property at this point since, you know, we bought that, uh, you know, over 18 years ago, um, taxes are, are really low. They're about, uh, 1500 a year. And then just your normal water, sewer, trash charges that, that, you know, around again around fifteen hundred years, so we're making uh, when it all nets out about a good nine or ten thousand um, dollars straight up on on that property. So it's not a ton of money. It's it's certainly not the most attractive property in the world, but it's it's um, it's not a dump. I mean, it's it's very nice. It's workforce housing, um, but it um, but it pays the bills and it's appraised multiple times at around a fifty five sixty thousand dollar valuation. So uh, we got a really good deal on it from a from a private seller. Had to put some money into it over the years, but it just sort of um, just sort of operates really easy. It's in a great area. Um, if we get it, if we do have a vacancy, uh, the area is really nice that people are looking uh, looking to live live in. And so, um, so yeah, it's just that I've, I've held on to it because I feel like it's a, uh, it's a good luck charm and I'm sort of a real estate hoarder. I've, I've started to <laughs> sell some things recently, but I, I have a hard time giving up when, when I buy a property, I want to keep it and hold it forever. So, yeah, it's tough. I mean, that's your first property. It, it sounds like it's performing uh, incredibly for you. So why would you want to get rid of it? Right. Yeah. So, so let's kind of talk about the progression here because there, there's sort of parallel things going on. One is you and your wife bought this property and it was, you know, kind of the, the beginning of building a portfolio that would, would eventually lead to you both being able to leave your full time jobs. And, you know, here you are now investing in multifamily syndicating. Um, uh, at, at what point did you make that? transition from the residential multifamily, which would be like the duplex uh, to the four unit up to the commercial multifamily? Sure. Um, so we sort of peppered in those types of properties throughout the years. So as I focused in my own backyard, I, I, growing up in the business, I never, I never envisioned investing outside of the area until in, in recently. In your own backyard, but, by the way, is Erie, right. Pennsylvania? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I really focused on um, mom and pop sellers. So our, the person that sold us our first property ended up selling us our second property, third property, fifth property. And then uh, we sort of bought out their portfolio. Well, one of the units they had was a seven unit. And that was my first taste of something a little bit bigger than a, than a three or four unit. And, um, and it went, the seven unit just seemed to run a lot easier than, than the, the twos and threes. And, and so that, that was in 2004. And so then I really started focusing on trying to identify and find something bigger. And in 2005, um, met a gentleman who, uh, just, I was flipping through the newspaper. I mean, that's a time when we, people still read newspapers, but there was a classified ad that said local investor liqu liquidating portfolio, 129 units, all must go. And so, so I called him and he ended up selling me 56 of his units, held the paper. Um, I came up with 10% down. Now, they were multiple locations, but he really treated it like a multi, big multifamily uh, uh, project. There was a 16 unit, a 14 unit, a, and a, a couple four units and three units in, in the mix there. And my gosh, it just ran so well. And I still have, I've sold some of those off and I've, I still have s several of those as well. But at that point, I really got the bug for for the bigger type of property. And um, as as properties came up um, over the years, you know, we'd pick up a 15 unit or a 20 unit or a 30 unit, and and really had a lot of luck and a lot of success with those smaller multifamily properties at like 15 to 30 unit range. And sort of, you know, fast forward to now. I mean, we just picked up an 86 unit property. One of the deals we have under contract is a 67 unit, um, and, and my my strategy in terms of identifying those in a smaller market is just making friends with the sellers and and getting to them before the real estate brokers get to them. So a lot of just trying to cultivate that off market deal, um, but you know not everything's been off market. I have a couple of really good friends that are real estate brokers, and and they they bring us deals all the time as well. 
but but that big multifamily stuff as you know is is um is the ultimate goal i think i i i've learned that you know it's way easier to own one 50 unit project than it is to own 50 single single family homes yeah i i would agree with that are you, are all of your properties in your area like within near erie pennsylvania yeah they're all near they're in the erie county so um we, we've got a, a a decent sized part of our portfolio i'd say gosh maybe 65 70 percent of the portfolio is located within the city of erie and then the, the majority of it of the rest of it is is within the county so a little um what's you know, the furthest you would have to drive to see any of your properties 20 25 minutes okay so so yeah they're all pretty much in your backyard I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. So what do you and your wife do about managing these properties? When we started out, we just did it all ourselves. I mean, bought a duplex, we were collecting rents and we were uh, doing the leases and we were painting the apartments and all that kind of stuff. But once we got above 20 units, um, we really saw the need for having having employees or having a stable of uh, subcontractors and people that can handle the dirty work for us. So um, I am not handy in the least least bit. I'm, I'm terrible at a lot of those things. And so sort of my own inability to do some of that work well um, forced me to grow and, and be able to hire people that were really better at that than, than I am. And... Um, so what we were able to do along the way was, you know, if we bought a big package of properties, we would oftentimes be able to take one of the employees with from that seller with us. So somebody that already knew the properties that had a baseline of systems and, and things in place that that helped make the transition easier. Um, you know, we've grown that now to where we have our own, you know, internal property management company where, you know, we have a we have a bookkeeper. Uh, we have you know, we have account an accountant on staff, uh, property manager, leasing agent, office manager, and a team of maintenance guys that are out there kind of hitting the pavement every day, making sure that they're taking care of any immediate issues, taking care of um, you know some of the the uh, property improvement projects, things like that that we have to have to take care of. Um, you know, it's it's uh, definitely not an easy task. I've learned a lot about building a business in terms of building your, our own infrastructure, but you certainly save a lot of money if you do it yourself, um, but it does take a little bit of time and effort to do that. When you say do it yourself, you mean the way you're doing it where you've hired your own team or if you're just trying to do everything? Um, both. I would not recommend trying to do everything for too long. I mean, it is nice to be able to have that firsthand experience in, in terms of knowing what it takes to get to get the job done. But I think um, you know, hiring your own team as opposed to having a third party man management company that um, that you don't know whether they're doing the most optimal job that they can. Um, and I think are, that's. A, okay, are you managing ahead. so through Paro Real Estate? Are you managing only your properties, or do you manage for other pe people as well? Uh, yeah, no, we only manage our own properties. So I've, uh, when I was kind of growing our business, I, we thought that that was something we wanted to get into at one time and very quickly learned that, um, y you know, the only time people call you is, is when they're mad. So you, you have uh, other people's tenants calling you and, and they're upset because the owners aren't going to budget for repairs or there's something going on at their property that you don't have as much control on. And I just, um, you know, I just, seem to be a lot more headache than what it was worth at least on the smaller scale properties i think when you get into larger larger portfolios larger properties it's certainly probably a much more lucrative and uh um easy thing to do but i think for anything you know anything that's not bigger multifamily, i, I wouldn't I, w I don't think i'd even consider going near it you certainly have to wear two hats doing what you're doing because you have the the business part that you mentioned with the management company and and you're managing people you know you're hiring people probably firing people on your team yep. um, and then you have the investor hat that you have to wear 
Uh, at this point, where you have over 460 units, how do those two work together? I think what, what's it's helped me realize, at least in the last year or two, is you know my best use of time, my best role is the investor hat, and um, you know sort of taking that really high level CEO approach. So when we, you know, we have 640 units, another 140, 150 under contract. Um, That's where my time is best spent. And, and um, where we've, it's it's been a challenge is in in the people management and hiring and firing. Um, But I wouldn't trade it for the world. I know what goes into that. And so we've, it's forced us to, to, you know, search out and hire an office manager and, you know, hire a business manager, somebody to be able to keep, um, you know, keep the property management team in line and keep the maintenance crew in line and keep everything on task and on target. So, um, so I, I think it's good to try and do both things, but when you realize you're not good at it, you definitely have to have to focus on what you're best at and, and delegate the rest off to someone else. So um, that's what I found out. I mean, I've had a lot of fun, growing our team and building the business. But my, again, my best, uh, my best use of time is, you know, has found itself in the kind of steering the ship and, and making the investments, you know, what to buy, what to sell, how to finance it and, and things like that. And just really from the high level strategy part of part of the company. So where are you right now? I mean, I know you have a, uh, what, 147 units under contract. What, how is, how is your focus changing? What, especially with the market, given, given the, we're early 2019, 2019, you know, the market's super hot right now. People are paying ex- extremely high prices. Where do you see your business going? Um, so I, in our market, I, I see my business going in, in, a, in a couple directions here. Um, Still focused on growth, but um, someone at, at the conference I was at this past weekend mentioned, you know, they're both a buyer and a seller of real estate. So, you know, some of the properties that were once great to me have maybe run their useful life for me and my business, and would be great situations to to sell off to an up and coming investor. So, uh, I've been selling property to uh, some of the up and coming guys and gals in our town that. Um, with selling the property comes a little bit of mentorship. You know, they take us, you know, take me out for a coffee or a lunch and, you know, they, they're trying to learn tips and tricks on how to run their business. And, you know, they ultimately end up buying some property and I've, I've held the financing on that the same way that some of the um, mentors that I had in the business did for me. So it's really a rewarding relationship, not just from a business standpoint, but being able to kind of help coach and grow and nurture some of the up and coming investors. So that's one focus again, is getting out of some of the smaller properties, but, doing it in a smart way. And that's freed up time, energy, and, and capital to focus on the, the larger properties. So um, really not looking at anything below 20 units. And and if it's between 20 and 40 units, it really has to be a compelling reason uh, to buy it. Um, but there's, so it's fewer deals, but smarter, larger deals has been the focus. And um and I've been networking with a lot of uh, a lot of sellers with off-market properties, and really trying to imprint on them is that if they want to sell their property anytime between now and the next ten years, they're never going to get a higher amount for their property than they will right now. So it's in their best interest to to sell that property now, uh, based on where you know where the interest rates are gro- going, cap rates are going. Just seems like we're in a in a really, uh, really good position uh, for, for a seller to be able to walk away from their property. So that's what I've been focused on. And I think as, as we continue to grow, it's going to be, um, again, focusing on the larger properties, things that are more predictable. Um, and that's, I guess, a good lesson I've learned on, on a lot of that sort of blending these smaller types of properties and larger types of properties is that the larger units, the multifamily units, anything above 30 or 40 units are gosh, even 15, 20 units are really easily predictable. I can look at my year over year analytics and everything's within a few thousand dollars of each other. But, you know, you have, you have a duplex and you could be a hundred percent occupied one year and then, you know, 50% occupied the next year because you've had two, two turnovers and the time it takes to turn over the unit, you know, lease up the unit and, and get, get the revenue going again, can really wreak havoc on your finances on, on the smaller types of properties. 
Yeah, that, yeah, I found that to be true, too. If you are thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition five years ago, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB & Associates. Chad is a professional health care insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason, or losing employer coverage, or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates LLC.com. So when you look at your numbers and you know you, you talk about how predictable they are, what what do you typically see as far as your your expense ratio so I, I try to budget my expense ratio around 50 percent I mean that that's um, a good rule of thumb I mean obviously it's different for every type of property you know based on age and condition but I think um, as I'm trying to stress test um, stress test my deals and, and you know when you see where the market's going I think if we budget things at 50 percent then I feel as though no matter what happens we're going to be okay. And hey, if I have a great year and, and we only have a thirty percent expense ratio, well, well, great. But um, I don't think I, what I'm trying to eliminate is surprises in the in the in the uh, expense side of the equation. So if we budget a little bit higher, I think we'll you know anything that comes up is, isn't going to be as painful. So we you know it's not going to come out of my own personal paycheck. It's going to come out of the budget for the for that property or for the whole portfolio. And, and you know I'm really curious because you own your management company. Um, when you look at your expense ratio, is that – and it, your expense ratio seems pretty good. Is it lower because um, you own your own management company? And, and what difference does that make on your bottom line? Well, I think it can make – if you manage it properly, I think it makes a tremendous difference. So when you look at things such as like landscaping and snow plowing in our part of the country and, and uh, even apartment turnover, um, you know, if I have a guy on payroll that I pay – Say fifteen or twenty dollars an hour or two to uh, to snowplow. Um, you know he can do that at a fraction of the cost that a professional company would do. Now, of course, we have to invest in the equipment and and everything else, but we sort of have those services then on demand as needed, as opposed to waiting on someone else to handle it. Um, same thing with landscaping. I mean, you could hire a landscaping company and they charge you, let's say, twenty thirty dollars per per lawn for a smaller for a smaller lawn. The amount of the volume that you can take down with with having somebody on staff is is a lot more than than when you subcontract it out. Now on the flip side, when you subcontract subcontract it out, you don't have to think about anything and and it's just it's done for you. But we've in sort of a volume business like ours, I think that we've been really able to cut prices by having someone in house that's a specialist. You know, so we have people on our staff that just paint and all they do is paint and patch walls and hang drywall but if they're the wall and ceiling guys that's all they do they're a lot faster than somebody who's maybe a jack of all trades so really try to find specialists and and exploit what they're good at and um, and pay them a reasonable wage which is still way better than having uh, a third party come in and pay you know where we have to pay double or triple uh, the cost yeah that's really interesting so you you're what would typically be third party vendor expenses like landscaping snow plowing um drywall you actually have people on staff who just handle that for you i do yeah and, and you found that that that's a gives you a cost savings over time because just you, then you're right you do have the overhead of you know, having the equipment and keeping it maintained and dealing with it when it breaks down yep i i think we've tried it we've tried it both ways multiple times and i and i think ultimately for us, what's worked is having that control over the situation. So, for instance, if um, you know if we get hit with a really bad snowstorm like we did last weekend, and we had I don't know eight, eighteen inches of snow, um, I had a team of guys out, you know, sh uh, shoveling sidewalks, salting sidewalks, snow blowing, um, you know, move, moving snow with snow plows, and, and keeping the parking lots clean. And, and so they're able to react and respond faster than a subcontractor typically would. But at a cost that's, um, I mean, a, fra a fraction of, of the uh, of the time or energy or money. So it really it really does help our bottom line at the end of the at the end of the year. What other efficiencies do you bring with your management uh, company and your team that 
you know, people who hire third party management might have to pay extra for? I think that that's the big thing is the, you know, when it comes to uh, turning over apartments and just the responsiveness of, of maintenance, uh, maintenance requests. So we are, so our property management software, uh, and I don't want to plug any one, one software brand, but a few of them have uh, their maintenance portals. And, and it took me a long time to adopt that, that, um, that system where they were calling a third party directly and not us. But what happens is that they, get a, they reach a call center and that call center, they get a live person every time. And that was always the number one complaint from our, our tenants was that they could never get a hold of somebody. Well, you know, they wouldn't either not leave a message or it would be a couple hours before somebody called them back. So now they call, they get a, they get a live person. That person then routes that, uh, routes that maintenance request to the proper person on our staff or the proper subcontractor. So we do use subcontractors for like plumbing, heating, electrical work, the things that you would need a permit for or a license for. So um, it, it seems to be much like a really efficient way of handling things and, and then you know, we're not burdening any one staff member on our team with just handling the phone calls. It costs me a dollar per month per unit to to have that third party take those phone calls and route them to the proper people. It's worth it's worth every penny. And it seems so easy. I, I think a lot of people that you know, you've been in the business a long time. I'm not, I'm not sure how you handle it, but it seems everybody everybody uh, that's gone to the call center route has has seemed to really. Uh, have, have the same type of thing to say if, if they have a good one. I mean, I, I think some people have adopted it and not not been as thrilled with the service, but I know with the one we use, they uh, they get a live person 24-7. Um, you know, they again, if it's emergency, it gets routed pretty much immediately. So it's not perfect, but it's it's better than the, the man, manual system that we were using before. So I, I know we're not endorsing any one particular yep. software or, or uh, management system, but uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and tell us who you're using. Sure. So I've been using PropertyWare. Um, I've tried a couple different other um, uh, companies and products out there, and uh, I've been I've been happy with PropertyWare because uh, it gives me the reports I need to see on the front end, such as um, you know the revenue side, the leasing side, um, you know where we're at, kind of like a daily dashboard. But also on the maintenance side of things, it really helps track uh, the volume of calls. And what I like to kind of the metrics I want to look at at year end every year is, hey, did this one property in particular cause me a lot of fits and problems? Or was there a vacancy problem in this part of town or this neighborhood? And, and really dig into some different different metrics so I, I can kind of pick up on the clues in terms of, hey, maybe this is a property or a group of properties I need to sell or, hey, maybe this is a part of town that I need to uh, start looking at buying more property and because it runs it runs so well. And and, uh, I, and so I really like that. I think there's some other ones that are great out there. I know that um, some of my friends use Appfolio, Buildium, and, and I think they all have very similar positive things to say. So I, I think the most part for your listeners is if they're not using a property management software, they need to find one and, and start using it right away because it will save them time, energy, and and ultimately, if they use it the right way, it'll help make them money. So I know that recently, uh, in 2018, you started syndicating and, and bringing uh, investment partners, other people's money into your deals. What led you to that decision? That's a good question, and, there, and there's a couple of answers to it. Um, when I was building my business, so I'll kind of rewind you know, 10 and 15 years ago, um, in my mind, I, I had just reservations and, and really was not positive about uh, the idea of partnerships. And I just, in my mind, I had this negative connotation that, oh my gosh, you have to answer to 8, 10, 12 people. Why would you ever do that? And I liked owning all the deals 100% on my own. Um, but but ultimately, I, I um, was kind of paying attention to some of the guys that had been in the business a long time. Um, and they seemed to be happy and they had partners and wanted, wanted to figure out how that worked. And and the God's honest truth is one of my buddies recommended Rod Cleef's podcast. And, you know, you and I met each other through Rod, but um, Rod talks a lot about syndication. And I, so I started learning about how people were putting their deals together. And, and the thing that really struck me was that, you know, if you're the quarterback of the deal, if you're the syndicator, you're calling the shots, you know, when you're the, when you're the GP or the general partner. And, and as long as you put together a solid deal, there shouldn't be any strife or rift amongst amongst the partners. So it seemed like 
if we can put together a good deal and put together a good team, there's really not any downside in terms of bringing in other, other people that, um, that would be looking to invest. And about a, two years ago, a, uh, uh, an ex ex client of my wife's when she was in sales had, uh, they ran into each other at the grocery store and he said, he said to her, Hey, I know you guys are involved in real estate. I'm thinking about real estate. I'd like to talk to your husband. Now he's a successful physician. There's no reason he would pursue a real estate career full time or anything, anything like that. But we ended up meeting and he had indicated he had some money he would like to deploy or invest in real estate. And, you know, at the same time, I started listening to the podcast and, and, thought, well, hey, there's a really good opportunity to possibly joint venture on something. And so we, we started doing a couple joint venture deals where he would put up the capital and be basically a debt partner and receive a little bit of equity. But I was incentivized to put together a good deal. And if I ran it well, then I get compensated. That That's where my payer, my, um, you know, my benefit of the deal comes from. And so we did a, a few of those very successfully. And we're, we we're able to do larger deals. So when a 40 unit or a 50 unit came up, it was just really easy. We, we had a, you know, a really good one-on-one -on -one, um, partnership, joint venture type agreement that, that seemed to work. And, and throughout that time, I had, um, had started thinking bigger and thinking about, well, hey, how do we put a team together to take down something that might be several million dollars? And uh, a property came up last summer that seemed to fit perfectly for that. So it was an 86 unit deal. And in our market, it was, um, you know, it's a little bit lower price, but it's a great property. It's a, a B property in a B area. Um, cost us about $4.15 So I ended up raising about $1.5 and had over-raised on, uh, uh, on the capital raise. Um, it wasn't as nearly as hard as I thought. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't that difficult. Um, and what I found was that a lot of, people are looking for real estate deals, but they don't want the headaches. You know, they don't want the trash to tenants or toilets and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and, and they want some sort of value add from an investor standpoint where, you know, they're, you know, kind of pummeling their money away into their 401ks or their IRAs, or even just to their brokerage account. And they're subject to the whims and, and sort of ups and downs of, of the equity markets. And, and really they're not getting any cash flow. And that's ultimately, what sort of led me to feel as though there's a great value add we can give to our to to people looking for uh you know a couple you know either a vehicle to grow their money or just to be able to create you know a steady predictable cash flow and and so i really got hooked on being able to provide that value to uh you know to a group of investors um but also benefit in the process by being able to buy and acquire larger properties and, and do something as a team um, and, and, you know, taking the focus away from the smaller, the smaller deals. There's a couple questions that I want to ask you here. Um, first of all, let's, let's just talk about structure. Okay. Um, when, when you're joint venturing with one other person and a joint venture is basically you and one other investor, um, typically, how did you structure that? I mean, who, who brought how much to the table and, and how did you split up that pie? Sure. So, um, I'll give the example I used with this particular gentleman. We, uh, his name is Scott, and we, we did uh, four deals together last year. And basically, he brought, for instance, one deal was it was a million dollar deal. Um, he bought, or the, uh, the purchase price was a million dollars. He brought three hundred fifty thousand dollars to the table. Now that covered acquisition, down payment money. Um, some rehab money and um, every, you know everything it took to get into the deal and, and turn the units around. So there's a little bit of a value add in the in the deal. So um, you know the as completed value was 1.35 million. So his 350 thousand we were able to get in the deal. He receives 35 percent equity of of the deal, no cash flow, uh, but he gets a guaranteed return every month. So. Um, and we guaranteed meaning that it, that's a loan payment to the LLC that we create from the LLC that we created. So he gets a steady, predictable cash flow, and then I, I receive the property management and um, uh, and, and pro other profits. So um, his concern was having just that set amount every month and having a little bit of equity at the end of the day when this thing's paid off. So it seemed like it was a win-win, uh, a win-win uh, for both of us, and um, and it, and that model seemed to work well for. 
for he and I. Now, some people would hate that model, but for us, it, it, it was for that particular guy and, and, and how we'd work together, it seemed to, seemed to be perfect. So it sounds like with this particular investor, he was most concerned with just making sure he got some sort of preferred return each month, but then also got a little bit of the, the equity at the, the back end. Correct. Yep. So is that a preferred return on the 350000 that he originally invested? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. And then, um, and then of course, when you do a syndication and you're, you're pulling together multiple investors' money, uh, you got to, it kind of expands your options there as to how you want to split up that pie. How have you structured your syndication so far? So, yeah. So for the syndication that, uh, the last one we did, and, and I think the model moving forward, uh, you know, we, we did an 8% preferred return and uh, it was an 80 20 split. So, uh, 20% for, the, for myself for putting the deal together, 80% for the investors, and they, you know, again, they have the 8% preferred return. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we didn't do anything really creative with the waterfalls or, or anything like that. I think um, that's a concept that a lot of, for several of the investors, it was their first syndic syndication. And, you know, when we started explaining some some more complex ideas, they started to gloss over. So um, I think we definitely want to get more creative and more advanced with it, the more syndications we do. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with keeping it simple. And that certainly makes the bookkeeping and accounting portion of it easier as well. And as you raise money from investors, are you going to friends and family, ex coworkers? Where, where are you finding your investors? So what I did, I, um, I approached, I first off approached a group of, um, just, I kind of went through my role deck. So I created like a target list, actually put together an Excel spreadsheet of people I knew, and that could be friends and family and, and use the term friends loosely. Some of them might just be social acquaintances, but people that we were able to meet over the years that had either mentioned that they were interested in real estate or they're interested in talking about investments. And, and I, I probably had 50 or 60 people that I, um, pulled up on the target list. And I, of course, did not approach every single one of them. Um, but I just, you know, I, I give a phone call, an email or a text message and say, hey, I, I know we were at that, uh, you know, at that event at the country club a year ago, or hey, we're at this house party a year ago. You mentioned you would um, want to talk about real estate investing. If we ever had a deal, guess what? I have a deal coming up. And then, you know, would you want to meet for coffee or a beer or dinner or lunch and, and hear what we have to you know, hear what, we're, hear what we're working on and just really took a low pressure, low key approach to it and really got to dig in to see what their needs were and what, what types of investments interested them and see if it was a fit. And if there was a fit, then we kind of took it a step further and, um, you know, and, and pitched them the, uh, the deal that we had had in front of us. And, you know, everybody really thought we had our ducks in a row and, and everything was put together well. Um, you know, some people said yes, some people said no. And um, really the feedback was really positive, which kind of got me hooked. I said, wow, there, I'm onto something here. There, there's definitely a need for investors looking for deals. Yeah. So what, what kind of uh, syndication were you doing? Was it a 506B where you, you could only go out to people that you had pre-established relationships with or a uh, 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 506C, where you could do a little bit more marketing and advertising? Uh, it was a B. Um, again, for, I think for the first one, I, we wanted to um, kind of make it a, a, a an easy an easy play. And it was a very, we were very timeline oriented with that, that for the first indication because the seller was on a very strict deadline. And, uh, and so unfortunately we were, we were under the gun. So I didn't, didn't have a lot of time to put together any sort of marketing and go through all of the, the, you know, the proper approvals for that. So we figured stick with people we had, you know, pre-existing relationships with and, and it definitely worked. I think in the future, uh, I think the C certainly gives you a lot of, um, a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can market and probably, probably helps the capital raising efforts go a little faster. Um, but we didn't have the time to do the legwork ahead of time to, to get that done. And what are some of the lessons you learned about raising money? Well, I think the thing is, the biggest thing I, I've told anybody that that's asked me about that in the last couple of months is that it was a lot easier than I thought. And I should have been a lot more confident about my own skills and experience in the process. So I, I had certainly done a fair amount of hard money lending, private lending, or I mean, working with pr private lenders and hard money lenders. But 
raising money for you know doing an actual capital raise i hadn't and so it's just the unknown and like everybody says you know just the fear of the unknown is no big deal you just have to take action and just taking that action we got over the i got over the fear really quickly and and um so that was the big i mean i think the big takeaway for me was just how easy it can be and should be um and, and really not to overcomplicate the process um but at the same time, I think it's equally as important to make sure you have your ducks in a row, have a nice presentation put together, make sure you know uh, you know your investments inside and out, make sure you know what you're you know what you're offering and and what what it really is. Because if you come in and you're not confident, then I, I think your potential investor is going to smell that, and they're they're certainly not going to have a lot of confidence in in putting placing their money with you if if you're not uh, if they don't believe in you. Because really, ultimately, they're betting on you. And your ability to find a good investment and make that investment perform so they can get a nice return on their money. Yeah, and you, you mentioned make sure you have a nice presentation. Now, I know a lot of syndicators, they like to do webinars or PowerPoint pres uh, presentations in front of an audience. Uh, what kind of presentation did you put together? Yeah, so we um, I put together a, a nice PowerPoint presentation um, and ultimately put that in a binder. You know, we I think I bound like 100 copies, but... Um, Never really did the PowerPoint presentation because ultimately most of our meetings were, you know, coffee meetings, lunch meetings, you know, ha you know meeting at a happy hour or something like that. So it was a lot of sit down face to face. Um, but I, I think moving forward in terms of making the capital raise go easier, I think it definitely makes sense to put a webinar together, put to, you know, actually put together a presentation where we invite, excuse me, invite investors to, um, to come, you know, come hear the presentation and kind of kill more birds with one stone. There's no sense in going out and meeting with 50 people individually if you can get 50 people in one room at one time. Yeah, so you you would do it differently that way. Uh, I would next time. Huh? Um, and, and then with the the deals you have under contract, you're going to be doing it again pretty soon here, huh? Yes, sir. So um, I am. Uh, I've already started putting my feelers out there to a couple of the uh, friends that have partnered or invested with me before and said, Hey, I think if this thing goes under contract, I have a really good opportunity. Um, any, you know, any interest. And so I'm starting to get that kind of just getting the engines warmed up and, and getting, getting the people that I know that I would prefer to have in the deal first interested in and lo locked up. So the minute we ink that contract, I can start making presentations to, to those folks to get things, you know, to get things moving. And you, you talked about, you know, early on and through most of your investing, you were buying with your own cash or borrowing private money, um, but basically maintaining 100% ownership. Now you're you're splitting that pie where your investors are getting uh, larger equity in the deal than you are. Um, what are your thoughts now? I mean, are you, are you fine with that? Is that or is, is that a better better model because you're able to take down more more deals, or or will you? ever go back to just buying stuff on your own well uh i don't think i'll ever stop buying stuff on my own one, one of the deals we have under contract is a 20 unit that um is just it's going to be in my wife's and my or our, our business name but i, I like I, I think liking it to a toolbox toolbox syndication is great but it's just one tool in the toolbox i think um you know a lot of people are looking to get into syndication they see these big deals and they see the big money but you know, you could talk to somebody that has a thousand units, but if they only own 10% of it, um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but you know, that's the same as somebody owning a hundred units all to themselves. And I, I think that, uh, for me, the way I, I kind of envision this and look at it is just a hey, syndication's awesome. It, it's, it's, it's a fun business, but it's one tool in the toolbox. So we'll continue to own deals on our own outright. You know, we'll continue to, if we find a great house that we want to go flip or if there's a wholesale opportunity, I think for me, it's, it's that art of the deal, the, the, you know, um, you know, the, the idea of putting a deal together keeps things fresh in your mind and keeps your skill set sharp. So, um, I, I hate to overcommit and just go all in on one particular, uh, method. Um, again, I, I just like having a diverse way of doing things. And if, if we syndicate a couple deals a year and we put a couple into our own, own name every year, it's just, you know, it just kind of keeps the engines going and keeps, keeps the business moving forward. Now, I want to switch gears here and talk about something that you and I both have in common. Uh, you are the president 
of your local RIA. And, and I'm, I'm currently the president of the RPOA here in Grand Rapids. Tell me about just your involvement with the RIA and why you got involved with them in the first place. Sure. So uh, our RIA is called the uh, Apartment Association of Northwest Pennsylvania. And um, I, I became involved uh, shortly after I bought my first property. I, I joined the Apartment Association and mainly at the time because I heard, you know, they had a lease that, you know, that I should use for my property. So they provide the lease, the lead-based paint forms and all the other landlording uh, forms that, that an investor needs. And you know, they have monthly monthly meetings. And I really didn't go to my first monthly meeting until 2005 when I uh, my unit count went, you know, t- took a jump up to about seven, 79 units. And once my first couple of meetings and I saw a, a lot of similar, you know, landlords of similar sizes, you know, you had your mom and pop landlords with five or 10 units and you had people with hundreds of units and a bunch of people in you know, sizes in between, but just really good, good time to network with other landlords and, and other investors. And um, they had a board opening in I think it was 2006 and I put my resume in and joined the board. And um, over the years I became vice president and was vice president for gosh, like eight or nine years and then became president uh, of the association about a year and a half ago. And um, I just think it's a really good idea for any investor, whether they're just starting out or they've been in it in the business 20 or 30 years to surround themselves with like-minded individuals. You, you know, this is a, it, landlording is not like a, a corporate job where you can kind of commiserate over the water cooler. Um, you know, we sort of need those those times that we can, you know, uh, just kind of network and gripe about, you know, gripe about the the crappy tenant that they had to deal with or you know celebrate our successes and talk about the great deal that they you know that you just completed or the new exciting thing you're working on or or just sort of sharing your your trials and tribulations sort of just sort of like a mini mastermind type of type of thing and i really encourage anyone and everyone that has opportunity to join aria join join the networking groups and surround yourself with people that have done it and people that are looking to do what, what you're doing too yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know, you're you're right. It's great to surround yourselves with uh, like-minded people. Uh, but you took it a step further and joined the board and volunteered, and, and now you're the president. Why why is that important? Yeah, I think it's important to give back. I mean, I really really enjoy this business, and I feel like I've seen a lot, done a lot, had a lot of success. You know, had a ton of seminars, as people like some people like to call them, or or mistakes and challenges along the way. And I um, I really like to see people helping the young up and coming landlords or the people that have been in it a long time struggling with certain things. Um, you know, we've all been there and, and it's, it's important to feel as though you, you, you know, you have people in the, in the industry that have your back. And, and I really, uh, I, I just really think it's important to be able to, to do that. I, I certainly credit a lot of my success with, with the uh, mentors and, and folks that I've met through the years. And a lot of them I met through our local RIA. So it's a great way to give back. What, what would you say to, uh, people listening who have joined their RIA or RPOA and are thinking of, of volunteering and taking on more of a leadership role. Sure. I would, I would say just do it. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, no one wants to extend themselves too thin, but the amount of time that it takes out of your schedule really is not, um, not that much. And what you get out of it, you can't, you can't put a price on it. Certainly a, uh, um, you know, it, it's a get position where you give and that you uh, serve others, but what you what you give, you get back tenfold. And um, you know, and I think it's a it's a it's a great thing to do. And if you're not sure of how to volunteer or how to get involved, you know, a- ask the president or ask a board member of, of your local area. And just um, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that you know, these groups are looking for people to volunteer and looking for people that are willing to put their time, energy, and time and energy into the organization. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for putting it so well. Um, you're, you're, if you are thinking of volunteering, uh, you are needed and wanted and um, welcome. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's my feeling, too. Um, so as we wrap it up here, Jason, what what advice do you have to our listeners? Any any parting thoughts or, or ideas for them? Um, sure. I, I think that, you know, a couple things. I think from the the uh, personal side of, of the business or personal side of life. I mean, um, don't neglect your your family or your friends uh, in the pers- or yourself in the pursuit of, of wealth. I think that um, you know things came a lot easier for me when I 
try to take life in a whole balanced approach. So, um, you know, make sure that you're, you know, you're spending quality time with your, your spouse or significant other spending time with your kids or your pets or your friends. Um, but you know, don't make money the ultimate goal. I mean, do the, you know, invest in real estate for the freedom and, and the things that it allows you to do in life. But if, if you're doing it just for the purpose of money, um, you know, find another uh, another vocation. I mean, this is a great uh, a great business to be able to build to to create the freedom and and enjoy the experiences that life has to offer. Um, you know, without having to grind out 80, 90 hours a week. Um, you know, and in, from an investment standpoint. Um, you know, it's, it's all about taking action. And when people say that, you know, you don't have to 10 X or hundred X your actions. It's just about taking daily steps towards a bigger goal. So, I mean, if that, you know, if you haven't ever syndicated a deal and that's the goal, just take a step, read a book, talk to someone who's done it. You know, you don't have to, you know, climb out Everest, Rome, you know, Rome wasn't, wasn't built in a day. It's just about doing these daily small uh, steps that'll get you to where you want to go. Yeah, fantastic advice. How would someone get a hold of you? So they can reach me um, on, on my email. Uh, it's jasonparo at yahoo.com. Um, they can find me on Facebook and they can also call my cell phone or text me and we can put that number out there. Um, that's area code 814-397-8030. Well, Jason, I want to thank you for taking uh, the time to talk with us today. Uh, it's been really interesting listening to you know how you were able to start with your duplex and work your way up to the point where you were actually, both of you and your wife were able to leave your full-time jobs. So thanks for all the great info. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks, you too, Brian. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group, and you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.